Are we going to call each other Mr. Mr. Cohen? Cohen. <laughs> exactly. Cohen and Cohen. That's going to be Cohen and name. Cohen. Between two Cohens. Exactly. Uh, clap when you're ready. One, two, three. Clap. Have fun, kids. Thank you. Hey folks, my name is Ezekiel Cohen. Today we're going to be speaking with Spike Cohen. No relation. Let's jump right in. Who are you, Spike Cohen, and what is your role in the Liberty Movement? I'm Spike Cohen, and welcome to Between Two Cohens. Uh, no, I uh, I was the Libertarian uh, Party vice presidential candidate in 2020, uh, and now I'm really just out here trying to help grow the Liberty Movement and, and help the Libertarian Party at the grassroots level. I launched an organization recently called You Were the Power. Uh, we are liberating communities one issue at a time and helping bring people into the movement as a result of that. Cool, cool. So we are here at Young Americans for Liberty Revolution 2022. As a part of the Libertarian Party, what are your thoughts on Young Americans for Liberty's strategy of supporting any pro-liberty candidate, regardless of their political party? I support it 100%. I, I think the Libertarian Party's purpose is to field and uh, and run and win campaigns. That That's the purpose of the party. And uh, I believe that we, I, I am a, a Libertarian Party partisan. I believe that we are the party of principle. Uh, I believe if you look at our platform and our candidates compared to others, we are definitely the, the most libertarian of all. Uh, but I also recognize the real politic of it. And the fact is that right now, uh, if you want to run for a lot of offices, it is far more cost effective to do so as a Republican or a Democrat than as a really anything else, as a, as a Libertarian, as an Independent, as a Green Party or anything else. And as much as I wish that weren't the case, it is. And so uh, I think that Yale's uh, nonpartisan strategy of working with whoever they can, viable candidates who are pro-liberty across the board, uh, is at least for now the best and most viable strategy. My job uh, and what I'm working on is growing a culture of liberty so that it doesn't matter what party is in charge because the people demand liberty and helping to grow the Libertarian Party. So eventually a lot of these candidates and elected officials don't have to choose between their principles and, and electoral viability. Awesome. So on that note, what is your pitch to little L libertarians to vote for Libertarian Party candidates as opposed to Liberty Republicans or Liberty Democrats? Well, first of all, my pitch is not just to vote. My, my pitch is to join. My pitch is to support the candidates that you support, possibly even to run for office yourself. My pitch is that the Libertarian Party, again, if you look at our our platform, if you look at our principles, if you look at our candidates, if you're a libertarian, then we most align with you. Again, I recognize the real politic of the thing. And so I'm not going to tell you uh, that, you know, at every single time you need to be, you know, voting libertarian or anything else. That's a personal choice for you to make. But what I would say is that whenever there is a viable opportunity to work with libertarian candidates, maybe even be one yourself to support those candidates, to vote for those candidates, I would invite you to do so. More importantly, I invite you to join our party help to grow our local and state affiliates so that we can build that base, grassroots base that we need to be able to be viable and effective. It's not just a vote. We need your we need your help to grow this movement. We are the grassroots army for human liberty, and we hope that you join us. Right on. So I want to change the topic to international relations, which have been very much in the news lately. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on America's involvement in the Ukraine and Taiwan right now? Well, I, I, America's involvement in the Ukraine is why Russia invaded Ukraine, and probably not for what many of you might think. Back in 1994, Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power on Earth. Now they're not. They don't have any nukes. And the reason that happened is because uh, Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin convinced, I, I don't even remember the name of the Ukrainian president at the time, that in, in exchange for assurances from both of them that they would never let anyone invade them and they would keep them safe, they gave up all their nukes to Russia. Yeah. So after they gave up their nukes to Russia, immediately you started seeing the pressure from the Russian side, uh, and it has culminated in now the invasion of Ukraine proper. Uh, you know, even before that, there was Crimea. Uh, right before that was Donbass, and now they're just basically taking over uh, Ukraine, and or at least trying to. And uh, Vladimir Putin is straight out saying that Ukraine is a is a, a fiction that never actually existed. It was created by uh, by the uh, by the communists, by the Soviet Union, and that Ukraine is actually a part of Russia. Now it's interesting that they didn't say that back when Ukraine had nuclear weapons. So I think that this speaks to a problem with nuclear non-proliferation as a strategy. It is as useful as a gun-free zone. Uh, it does not protect anyone. It actually allows the people that have no interest in giving up their nukes ever, like the U.S. and Russia and China and so forth, uh, from uh, from being able to protect them, that allows them to be able to uh, invade at will. It's not for nothing that the U.S. never considered invading or, or, or de overthrowing Gaddafi until after he gave up his nuke program. As that relates to Taiwan, same thing. Do you think China would be threatening a Taiwan with nukes? 
Exactly. So that's my thought on that. Um, also, I think a, a broader part of that is this is the consequence of relying on a strategy of choking off your economy with the intention that you'll just get the goods and services that you need from lesser economies, from dictatorial regimes that don't have to have any kind of environmental or labor regulations. They can use slave labor. They can do whatever they want. Uh, that helps the crony businessmen uh, who, uh, whose politicians implemented those uh, regulatory burdens and tax burdens here so that they could kill all of their smaller competition and then do business overseas and use the U.S. military to protect their goods and services back into the U.S. But it certainly hasn't helped our job market. It hasn't helped our economy. And it hasn't helped foreign policy because now China China, which uh, a couple generations ago was literally starving to death, uh, is now uh, I increasingly one of the, the world powers. And it's a direct result of uh, the U.S. and Western world, and, and same thing with Russia, the U.S. and Western world choking off their energy and their manufacturing with the idea that they'd rely on Russia and China, and that certainly would never go wrong. I think that we need to be looking at the regulatory burdens we create here that empower tyrants overseas. You gave some very interesting history behind the Ukraine conflict. Yep. That's certainly not common knowledge in the United States. Yep. A lot of the people who will watch this interview are from Europe. Yep. Do you believe this is common knowledge over there? I honestly couldn't tell you. I, I'm, I'm sure that there are many individuals and many people that know it, but I, I couldn't tell you how common knowledge it is. If I venture to guess, probably not. But honestly, I'm, I'm doing that from an American perspective where most Americans don't know a lot. So I, I will say when it comes to history anyway, uh, even recent history. So I honestly don't know. I will tell you this. I mean, if you're living in Germany, uh, for many years there have been warnings that the, the strategy of relying almost entirely on your natural gas needs for Russia just because it's cheap and it allows Germany to pretend to be green because they just have all the, all the, the dirty work done in another country because it's not like we all share the same climate or anything. It matters what you do in your country, not, not others. Uh, but as a result of that, you're empowering or, or the, the, the politicians that have created these regulatory burdens and this strategy of relying on foreign dictatorships and authoritarian regimes for all the stuff you actually need to survive. Turns out, if those people decide to get hanky, now suddenly, what are you going to do? Where are you going to get your natural gas? So this is a perfect example. Uh, and on the Chinese side, where are you going to get basically everything else that you get from China? Um, so this speaks to a, a problem with the idea of creating regulatory burdens in our country, in the so-called developed world, and then rely on the what they used to call the second world uh, and, the, and the third world uh, for the things that you need. Uh, if you're relying on Saudi Arabia and uh, Venezuela and Russia and you know the countries that our leaders refer to as the axis of evil uh, for all the stuff you need to live, that's not a good strategy. And we're seeing that play out again. Cool, cool. So about Ukraine specifically, yeah. what would you consider to be a favorable outcome to the conflict? And how do you think we could achieve that? I think that a favorable outcome to the conflict is Vladimir Putin realizing that he is decimating his own military. He's doing irreparable, uh, immeasurable harm to the people of Ukraine and pulling out. Uh, I think the best way, if you say we, meaning how can the U.S. help to achieve that? Yes, because is that plausible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know that the U.S. can convince Vladimir Putin it's a good idea to leave. I think that Ukrainians with machine guns have been certainly helping with that. Uh, but I would say that when it comes to what the U.S. could do, if I were in uh, Joe Biden's shoes, the first thing I would be doing is, is trying to actually talk without preconditions with Putin, saying that, listen, we, we know what's got the history of what's gotten us here. We know the 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 basically the pissing contest that's been going on between the US and NATO and Western powers and between uh, Russia and China and the, I guess the BRICS nations. Uh, um, you know, and, and that has been coming to a head and now here we are. And I would try to come up with some kind of series of de-escalations. Like a, 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 here we are now and here is where we can get to full normalization, full trade, full you know, open free relations between our country and your country. It has to start with you pulling out of Ukraine. And then from there, we can talk about you know getting rid of sanctions on both sides, getting rid of tariffs on both sides, getting rid of, of, of trade barriers on both sides, uh, you know political barriers on both sides, diplomatic barriers, and so forth. But coming up with a series of very small, feasible steps, but that first step has to be 
uh, uh, unilateral, unequivocal withdrawal from Ukraine and then stepping out from there. I think the other thing is not just in Ukraine, but moving forward, we need to realize that the idea of so-called nuclear non-proliferation is exactly the same as gun control and no gun zones. They don't work. It doesn't work to tell countries who want to defend themselves, you can't have nukes. It's okay. We're going to keep nukes and Russia's going to keep nukes. And China's going to keep nukes. Basically, all the countries that actually invade other countries, we're going to keep the nukes, but you can't have nukes. It, it's not a good strategy. It leads exactly to this. And I don't think there's a single person who could seriously look at any of us and tell us that a, a small country with nukes, or for example, Ukraine or Taiwan, there'd be any threat of invasion right now uh, for, for either of them if they had nukes. Do you think that in order to achieve peace, land concessions need to be on the table? Uh, that, honestly... There may have to be. I hope there aren't. I don't think there should be. And the problem with land concessions in exchange for peace, especially if the land concessions are being made to the much larger aggressor, is that that incentivizes future invasions with the idea that there be more land concessions for peace. Whether that is what's going to end up having to happen, I honestly couldn't tell you. It may have to happen. Uh, I, it, you know, it really depends on where negotiations go. Uh, I hope it doesn't, and I, I hope that we could do de-escalations outside of actually Ukraine having to give up a, a territory. Um, I will also say that I have been told, and I'm not going to admit to be an expert in this, I have been told that in Donbass that the people there actually want to be an independent nation. I don't know if that's true or not. If it is true, then we should be respecting the desires of the people there. And if they truly want to be an independent, autonomous nation, then I don't see any reason why they should be forced into an association that they don't want to be a part of. With that said, I don't know if that's true or if that's you know Russian propaganda. If that's not true, then it's not true. But if it is, you know, I think that people should be free to associate as they wish. Awesome. So the other flashpoint in the news right now is Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Do you think America's current policy of containing China and defending Taiwan is the right approach? And if we're not going to contain China, should anyone else do it? Well, I mean, we've contained China by sending all our jobs there and by completely destroying or increasingly destroying the ability of small and medium-sized businesses to have any kind of manufacturing here in the US. The only companies that can have any kind of real manufacturing here are large crony corporations that get massive carve-outs, bailouts, and, and, and tax breaks, and everything else. That's by design. Our system, it's important to understand, Ezekiel, that our system is designed to benefit the cronies who own the politicians. So when you look at how our trade policy works, how our foreign policy works, how our, uh, in this case, manufacturing policy works, it only makes sense if you look through it through the filter of how does this maximize the profits for a small handful of people at literally everyone else's expense. If you try to figure it out through, does this work from a forward policy standpoint? Obviously, it doesn't. If you try to figure out from, does it work from a, a jobs and, and, and labor standpoint? Absolutely not. And that's why we often say our system is broken. It's not. It's functioning exactly as intended. And the reality is, they have set up a system whereby they have destroyed all their smaller, smaller and medium-sized competitors. They control the market, which doesn't exist here anymore. It exists in China and other authoritarian regimes where they have their bases of operations set up. And then they use our military to protect their goods and services on that long trek back all the way to the U.S. where they sell us the stuff that they made over there that we aren't allowed to even try to make over here because of regulatory burdens that make it cost prohibitive to do so legally. What that leads to is the empowerment of China. I guess that's a type of containment. We're containing all of the power to China and it's clearly not working. And so when we look at, we look at questions like, should we support Taiwanese independence or should we be getting involved in it? This would not matter if Chinese communism was forced to stand on its own merits. We are intentionally, or our, our, our ruling class, is intentionally subsidizing the Chinese communist system, which if you want to talk about a bubble economy, China has entire ghost cities where no one has ever lived in. You want to talk about a speculatory, bubble-driven, fiat currency-driven economy? China's is makes ours look like an absolute pipe dream compared to how bad it is over there. The one thing keeping it afloat is the fact that our system subsidizes theirs for the benefit of the cronies who set up that system. If you simply pop that pin by by deregulating here and allowing jobs to come back and even better and newer jobs to flourish and grow here, they now have to reconcile the fact that before we were subsidizing them, they were starving to death. And they have to be a lot more humble both internally and on the world stage. 
Uh, you're saying that we've generally failed to contain China or have even empowered them. Do you think the goal of containing China was a good idea in the first place? I think that it, I'm not, I, I guess I question the premise that the goal was to contain China. I think the military industrial complex benefits from the, uh, the, the crony uh, manufacturing complex that intentionally turned China into a economic, social, political, and military threat so that then the military, com the military industrial complex cronies can benefit from the fear that that causes and all the trillions of dollars they get for weapons programs to contain China. I don't, I don't think the strategy was to contain China. I think the, the government strategy is to create crises and boogeymen and then exploit those crises and boogeymen that they, that they create to then create the solution to that, which never actually works. All right, I understand. And so historically, a country that used to keep the Chinese in check was Japan. And ever since we disarmed them after World War II, they <laughs> haven't been able to do that anymore. Right. After the assassination of Shinzo Abe, enough of their government uh, is now pro-remilitarization that it looks like that's going to be happening soon. Yeah. Do you think it's a positive development that the Japanese are rearming? And should the United States help them do it? Well, I, if you say the United States, meaning the United States uh, you know, weapons manufacturers, if, if they want to sell to the uh, Japanese military, I don't see any reason why why that should be stopped. Should the U.S. taxpayer be uh, subsidizing yet another military industrial complex like they do in the U.S. and Israel and well, Europe and most of the planet? No, they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but I think that if, you know, if, if Japan wants to rebuild their military uh, I, and, and you know, U.S. and other manufacturers want to help them with that, I, I don't see any reason why that should be stopped. Uh, it, it is very interesting, Ezekiel. You picture, how, you, you picture U.S. paranoia on this subject. We are concerned about a, a country uh, that is literally on the other side of the planet, that is increasingly showing aggression in the South China Sea. It's called the South China Sea because China's right here and then the sea is right here, south of China. This is, you know, it, it, the way that we, it would be like talking about U.S. military aggression in like the Gulf of Mexico or something like that, right? So the reality is, if anyone is at threat here, it would be Japan, which is right there at the South China Sea or right there, you know, across the strait there. Northeast. Or, yeah, the Northeast or, uh, or South Korea or any of these other, or North Korea for that matter. Yeah, any of these countries, uh, if they're the ones that see a threat, then A, that would be a much more viable threat because they're right there. Uh, but also, great, you all have developed economies, then build up your militaries. And, and I think the strategy of disarming everyone else with the idea that the U.S. military will just be the world's police. If there's anyone that's still advocating for that, uh, then I, I, I'm not sure what to tell you. It hasn't worked. The U.S. military industrial complex spent 20 years, trillions of dollars, and thousands of American lives to replace the Taliban with a better armed Taliban. Their system is not set up for actual defense. It's set up to waste a bunch of money on creating boogeymen, subsidizing them, and then using the fear to spend even more money on weapon systems. If you think that they're going to beat the PRC, I I'm not sure what to tell you. Will Japan do it because it's a ex potential existential threat to them? I think far more likely to happen. All right. Awesome. So that is the last uh, proper question I had lined up for you. Before you go, we are both named Cohen, and I want to play <laughs> off of that in the title of this video. Yes. So I want to run some potential titles by you yes. to get your opinion. Okay. So first, mm -hmm. Cohen's Collide. That, I mean, that's a, I don't like that. We didn't really collide, though. No, there was very little disagreement. That's what there. I mean. Like, if we were arguing, I could see that, but I like the, 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 um, the symmetry of it, but I don't know. Yeah. You came up with this one uh, before we started, Between Two Cohens. I like Between Two Cohens, but I, you know, I mean, I leave it up to you, but I like Between Two Cohens. Nah, it's very good. Okay. Uh, Cohens Converse Concerning Coercion. Oh, man, that's good. I like the alliteration. Um, man, if I hadn't come up with Between, between Two Cohens, I'd probably go. Uh, that, 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 let's workshop that. I actually like that. Okay, I, let's. Got it. And finally, this would make more sense if you were a Democrat, but I still think it still works here. Uh, Cohen's concerned about climate change. Well, I can make that true. Uh, so if you care about climate change, you support deregulation of nuclear energy. It is the safest. It is the most carbon neutral. It is the uh, cheapest. And it is the most effective and most reliable form of grid stable energy. If you're not talking about nuclear deregulation, you're not serious about climate change. Now we have talked about climate change, so we could use that one. I like between two Cohen's, man. I really do. Cohen's converse concerning coercion. That's, man. That could be the subtitle. You know, I was going to say, so like yeah. between two Cohen's. Cohen's cons conversing concerning coercion. I exactly. Like that. Okay, that we nailed it. We nailed right, it. That is our title. <laughs> All right, you asked for 15 minutes. It has been 
20. I only five minutes over is too bad for you, right? No, it's fine, man. That's good. Any final messages for the audience? No, listen, man. The libertarians want you to be free. We recognize that you do best when you are most free. We recognize that the problems that you are facing are as a result of too much power in the hands of too few people. And whether we call ourselves libertarians, classical liberals, if in Europe that's that's often what's used as liberal is the term, uh, anarcho-capitalist, whatever we call ourselves, I call myself two of those. Uh, the uh, Our proposal is that the way that we do better is by taking the power out of those hands of, pe of the people and, or taking those powers out of the hands of those people and putting it back in your hands where it always damn well belonged. Because we do better. We make decisions for ourselves far better than these craven lying politicians and the cronies who own them do. Right on. Spike Cohen, thank you so much. Thank you, Ezekiel Cohen. Hey, guys. I hope you liked the interview. So this interview was the climax to a series of increasingly unlikely events, which all started when I happened to meet John Stevenson, one of this video's producers, for the second time in Miami. That same day, the two of us would sit next to a former Young Americans for Liberty chairman at a lunch table. His name was John Stein. The three of us became fast friends, and he invited us to join him at Revolution 2022. If you want the whole story, I left it in the pinned comment below. What I want to tell you guys is that none of this, not being able to be here in Florida where I met these guys, not securing a press pass at a big event like Revolution 2022, and certainly not being able to secure interviews with figures like Spike Cohen would have been possible without you guys. The size that this audience has reached was vital to multiple steps in this process, but so was the support you've given us by watching our videos, crowdfunding us, encouraging the team and I in the comments, and just plain being being a super high quality audience was what made this possible. So thank you guys for everything. We're going to keep doing the best work we can for you.